It is my joy to welcome you to our morning worship service, praying that the Lord will draw near and bless us as we gather before him. I wish to welcome also our radio audience as you tune in to this service going out from Bellamina Free Presbyterian Church. As the Word of God goes forth from our pulpit over Radio Ulster, it is our prayer that God's power and presence will be felt by all who are listening. Should you wish to know more about our ministry, I invite you to visit our church's website. Bellamina is located in Mid-Antrim. The town is built on land given by King Charles I to the Adair family in 1626 and has enjoyed a varied history since that time. However, on a spiritual level, Bellamina has been highly favoured by another king, the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1859, God sent a spiritual awakening to the people of this town and the surrounding area. The awakening commenced outside Kells, a few miles from where we meet, quickly spreading into the town itself. That move of the Spirit then swept over this entire province of Ulster, resulting in the conversion to Christ of scores of thousands of precious souls. As a church, we are praying for such a moving of God once again in our land. For our opening praise, we are turning to Psalm 100 on page 91. We will stand to sing, and at the end of the four verses, we will also include the doxology. Let us sing to the Lord's praise.
You will remember that two years ago we celebrated our 50th anniversary as a congregation. That was in November 2016. On the 4th of November 1966, our church was constituted as a member congregation of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. Our foundation members then were formerly part of the Gospel Tabernacle that met on the Waveney Road. The minister of the Tabernacle was the late Reverend James Kyle Paisley, a faithful Gospel preacher in Bellamina from the early 1930s. When the congregation became affiliated with the Free Presbyterian Church in that year, 1966, its first minister was the Reverend Paisley's son-in-law, the Reverend James Banks, who retired from the pastorate, as you all know, in the year 2000, but continues as our minister emeritus to this day. It is a joy for me to have him in the pulpit with me at this moment, and I ask him to come now, please, and lead us in our opening prayer. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we draw near to Thee this morning and enter into Thy holy presence in our Saviour's worthy and precious name. We humbly approach Thee on the ground of redemption and through the one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We thank Thee that as we come to Thee, we are accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We do pray for a gracious sense of the Lord's presence in the midst of his people in this service. Fulfill that great promise given in thy word, that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Grant that the Lord Jesus Christ may be at the very center of our worship here today. Bless all who will participate in this broadcast service. Remember our clerk of session, Mr. McCosh, as he reads to us the scripture. May they come with freshness and with power to every heart. Be pleased to bless the praise offered in thy name. Bless the congregational singing and remember the choir as they minister to us and bring these gospel messages and songs. We pray especially for our minister, the Reverend Greer, as he leads the service and conducts the worship. Particularly, we remember him as he opens the word and brings the message that God has given him for this occasion. May he know much of the enablement and power of God the Holy Spirit resting and abiding upon him as he rightly divides the word of truth and declares unto us the gospel. Take the message preached and apply it effectually to every heart. Speak to the congregation assembled within this house and likewise to that large and unseen congregation who listen in by radio and webcast this morning. Grant that all may hear the word of God with profit. We pray that those who are without Christ and are yet unsaved may realize their need as sinners and be brought to true repentance and to saving faith in the person and finished work of Christ at the cross. Meet the need of all who listen. Some are sad and mourn the loss of loved ones and need the comfort of the gospel. Some are aged and infirm and cannot be present. Some are sick in hospital or in home and need the healing touch of the Master's hand. Others are troubled and cast down with care and need the help and encouragement that only our Saviour can bring. We thank Thee, whatever our need, that need is met in our unchanging Saviour and our unfailing friend. Continue with us as we further worship Thee and grant that in all things the Lord Jesus will have the preeminence, the honour and the glory. Hear these, our humble prayers, and accept of our thanks, for we offer them in the Saviour's name and for God's eternal glory. Amen. Our next item of praise as a congregation 
is number four, one of Charles Wesley's great hymns, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. We will stand and sing verses one to four. Praise is going to continue now with the first item of praise brought by our men's choir, a wonderful piece entitled Glory to Thee, Thy Son of God Most High.
The reading of the Word of God is always a prominent uh, part of our worship services. So today, our clerk of session, Mr. James McCosh, will read God's Word for us. Our Bible reading this morning is taken from the New Testament and from 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, commencing at verse 1 and reading through to the verse 7. Let us hear the word of God. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Amen. And we pray that God will bless this public reading of his holy, infallible, inspired, and inerrant word. One of the great hymn writers of the Christian Church was William Cowper. And we're turning to hymn number 281, to sing verses 1 to 4. This great hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Hymn number 281, we will stand while we sing. I invite the men's choir to bring their second piece entitled, It Was Nothing But the Blood of Jesus.
Thank all who have taken part in the service today, and we appreciate the help that everyone has given. We're turning now to that passage from which our clerk of session read earlier, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And today I want to draw your attention to verses 5 and 6 in this passage. We will read them again. And here we have these wonderful words For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. These two verses come in a passage where the Apostle Paul urges the lifting up of prayer for all kinds of people. It is prayer that takes into consideration the fact that the Lord saves men from every nation, from every social level, and from every background. That is a point that is underlined in verse 4, where the Apostle refers to God having all men to be saved uh, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And notice from those words that being saved is inseparably connected with the knowledge of the truth. To be saved comes as a result of being brought to a knowledge of the truth. And as Paul makes that statement, he then proceeds to give three reasons why believers, why Christ's church must pray for men of every kind to be brought to that knowledge of the truth that they might be saved. Let us notice those three reasons. First of all, that there is only one true God. The opening words of verse number 5 are very important. A tremendous statement. It says, for there is one God. There is revealed truth of a vital importance. There is only one true God. The Lord Jesus Christ himself in John 17 verse 3 prayed these words, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That doctrine that there is but one true God is the very foundation of the gospel. The one true God who has revealed himself in the inspired and in the infallible scriptures thereby showing himself to be the God 
of all kinds of men. As the only true God, he is the creator of all men. Among men there are many differences and many varieties, but there is one thing in common among men, that is their origin. Genesis 1 verse 1 tells us that in the beginning God created, and that includes the creation of men. We find in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first man referred to here who was made by God at the beginning, that is, Adam. And the words are these, the first man, Adam. And here we are brought back to our beginning, to our common ancestry from Adam. God made one man, and God purposed that from that one man the human race would descend. In Acts 17 and verse 26, Paul declares the very same truth as he preached at Mars Hill. He says, God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of of the earth. A marvelous statement. God is made of one blood. That refers to one particular distinct species, namely mankind. He refers to all nations of men, all kinds of men, human kinds, wide variety. He speaks also that God made man to dwell on all the face of the earth. And so that has been fulfilled as God in his sovereignty disseminated the nations and the peoples of this world across the face of this earth. But the human race is one. And therefore, when we think about this, one race created by the same God, the one creator of all, it means that if men are going to be saved, then they need to come to know this one true God. He himself says in Isaiah 45 and verse number 22, Look on to me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. So we have this fact. There is one true God. He's the creator of all men. He's also the ruler of all men. The Apostle Paul, as he addressed the church in the city of Rome in that great epistle, said this, there is no difference. And he means there is no difference between men, Romans 10 verse 12, for the same Lord, the same Lord is over all. And here we have words that signify that the same God is the ruler of all men. And that fact generates among men universal responsibility, universal accountability. As you hear God's word today, you must learn from it that you are responsible to give obedience to him as your creator and your ruler and your lawgiver. He is your lawgiver. In Isaiah 33, verse 22, the prophet says, The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. One truth is inseparable from the other. One lawgiver, God the king, over all humanity, ruling and reigning over all men. And therefore see today that there's no exemption from this fact of being in subjection to the rule and the authority of God. And recognize as well that your disobedience to him, because all have sinned, remember, does not alter his rightful rule, nor your duty to obey him. As the only true God, he is also the judge of all men. That same verse, Isaiah 33, 22, goes on to say, The Lord is our judge. Think about those words. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. The Lord is our judge. The one judge and God of all, the judge of all the earth. And his being judge highlights the issue of every man's spiritual need and moral condition. And the word of God makes it very, very clear that all men have sinned because all men have transgressed the law of God, because sin is the transgression of the law. And there's no exception to this matter of having sinned. In Romans 3 verse 19, Paul makes this great declaration as he comes to the verdict in his discussion of the state of man, and he says, all the world is guilty before God. And so here's the first great fact that Paul brings before us, that there is only one true God. The second reason why we are to pray pray for all kinds of men is because there's only one mediator 
between God and men. That's what we find in the next words in our text. It goes on to say, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And the decided emphasis in these words is crucial. The Holy Spirit is underlining in this statement that only Christ alone can be the mediator between God and men because of who he is. That is because of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Now a mediator is someone who intervenes between two parties who are at variance, who are at enmity. And here they are, God and men. And men are going to be saved. Then they need to know the truth that someone stepped in. Someone became the mediator. And that mediator is none other than the God-man. This is the uniqueness of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then we have these mar- marvelous words, God manifested in the flesh. And in that statement, you've got the Lord's deity. He's truly God. And you've got the Lord's humanity. And those two natures come together into the one person of our Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of the miracle of his, bir- of his virgin birth. This is what Paul has in view. God manifested in the flesh. The virgin birth. Christ being born. Christ becoming man. But not ceasing to be God. And so... He is the only mediator because of who he is. And that means, therefore, that since there's only one such person as the Lord Jesus Christ, there only is one mediator. Paul spells this out in our text. One mediator between God and man. He says in Hebrews 8 verse 6, Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. He says in that same epistle, chapter 9, verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament. He goes on to say in chapter 12, 24, Jesus, the mediator of the New Covenant. That means that you cannot be right with God through any other person but Jesus Christ. He himself says this. Does he not? In John chapter 14 verse 6, where he says so categorically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the mediator, and he alone is the mediator, because he alone is the God-man. And therefore, unless you seek Jesus Christ alone, you will not be saved You cannot be saved because he is the only mediator between God and men. And the third reason why we are to pray for all men or men of all kinds is because salvation is found in only one sacrifice. For we find that Paul proceeds having stated that there's only one true God and there's only one mediator between God and men to say this, in verse number 6 of 1 Timothy 2, who gave himself a ransom. And there are wonderful words, because here are words that take us to Calvary. And we have been hearing about the cross and Calvary and our Savior's death and our Savior's suffering in the singing of our hymns today and in the rendering of praise by our men's choir. And it's vital that we get to Calvary. It is vital that we see the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as it's summed up in these great words. He gave himself a ransom in that verse. That word ransom is a vital word because it's a word that signifies the payment of a price in order to set an individual or a company of people free. And here is the Holy Spirit telling us today that the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself to pay the price for sin. And he did so at the cross. He did so at that place where he suffered and he died and he shed his precious blood. And because of who he is, the God-man, his sacrifice has the infinite value that is essential in order to the salvation of men. He took the sins of men. He took the debts of men. He paid for them. He fulfilled the whole compass of God's required demands. And therefore, he secured redemption. He made the atonement. 
that satisfies divine justice. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And those words could also be read, being made a curse over us. There's the idea of the mediator again. Between God and man, Christ interposed and he's over us. And in becoming over us as a mediator, he became a curse for us. And he paid the price. The extent of that work is shown here. A ransom for all. Again, all kinds of men is what it actually means. And that signifies that whoever you may be or wherever you may be today, either in this building or in that listening audience beyond these walls, there is someone who's able to save you because he gave himself a sacrifice, a ransom for all kinds of men, paid the price for the sins of all kinds of men. And therefore he calls upon men to come to him. And through the Apostle Paul he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. And I pray this day that whoever you may be, wherever you are at this moment as I speak to you, you will bow the knee and you will call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved by his grace and by the power of the gospel. One God, one mediator, one way of salvation. May God bless his word to all of our hearts for his glory and for his eternal praise. Could we bow in prayer, please? Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee for the word that we have looked at today and what we have heard from thee, and we pray that thou wilt use thy truth, bring it home to hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for the one mediator, the one Savior, between the one true God and sinful men. And this day may sinners be drawn to the Christ of God and be saved by thy marvelous grace. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his eternal glory. Amen. We come to the end of our service now. We want to conclude by singing hymn number 113, What Sacred Fountain Yonder Springs. We'll stand together as we sing this hymn number 113.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with all of those who are the Lord's people, both this day and then forevermore. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.